All right, let's get this set up properly here. And we've got his shoulder, he's ready to go. All right. All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is Dr. Wong Mike from PhysioU and Clinical Pattern Recognition, and I'm excited. This is our last live broadcast for Name That Pattern Live before CSM. Hopefully, a lot of you guys are going there, so I'll be curious. And today, actually, I have my iPad on the side, so I'm going to be looking out for people commenting. If you are just joining in, it's always better if you can log in through our clinical pattern recognition on Facebook, the direct site, so I can see your comments. I have a lot of interesting things that I want to tease out from you to tie things together. So, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining me. And um, tonight, I'm going to play, be playing out an extra pattern related to the shoulder problems because we're kind of in the shoulder region right now. And so, let me play the patient out first and then we'll go into talking about different things related to the patient. Okay, so for those of you who are just joined, thank you for joining in and make sure you are logged in through our uh, Physio U or actually our clinical pattern recognition page on Facebook so I can see your comments and I'm looking forward to seeing the things that you guys have to say today. So, all right, so patient walks in and he says, I'm here for PT, I'm having a lot of shoulder pain. I can't really play tennis right now because my shoulder is so sore, okay? So, and this ties into our talk at CSM, we're talking about tennis players and actually um, golfers, but this is about shoulder problems. So I'm coming to you and you, your first question to me is, could you just show me where's your pain, right? So we know that pain doesn't necessarily uh, relate to, pain location doesn't always tell us what pathology is there, but it's a good start. Okay, because most local pain problems to the shoulder, so let me just say, my pain is right here, okay? So, with me pointing over here and kind of over here, especially after I play a full set of tennis, my shoulder is really sore, I pretty much have to stop. Okay, so, so I'm curious, for those of you who are uh, online, I'm coming to you with shoulder pain, and I'm telling you, I've not injured it, I just hurt when I play tennis, and it especially hurts when I'm doing a serve, okay, when I'm doing a serve, or when I'm doing an overhead smash, okay? And so with repetitive serving, I'm complaining of a lot of shoulder pain. So I've got pain here, and it kind of aches after, after a game. So I'm curious, for those of you who are following along, and I'm just going to see here whether I, I'm able to see your comments, what are your thoughts related to what hypothesis you might have? And there shouldn't just be one. There should, there should be a few. Okay, so what are some of your, your comments and your hypotheses? So I'm watching here for your comments, looking for your comments here. Any thoughts? Here on this screen, I can't really see your comments just yet, but I'm trying to pull it up over here. Okay, any thoughts, anybody? Any comments about this pain pattern? Okay, I imagine some of you have put down, right, if I have tip of the shoulder pain, if I have tip of the shoulder pain, I should be seeing hypotheses like a comioclavicular joint sprain, right? So you guys have got that down. And let's see here. A chromial clavicular joint sprain, uh, subacromial impingement, would that be fair to say? Okay. Now, why wouldn't this, let me ask you, from considering our, our pattern that we talked about last week, why does this not sound like frozen shoulder? Okay. So I'm curious about what you guys have to say about that. And I'm just looking up here at some of your comments, trying to see. Okay, 
Why is this different from frozen shoulder? Well, for one, if I show you that this problem only hurts, I can get, I have no pain down here, and I have some pain through here, but when I get up to the top, I'm okay until I'm at the top of my serve and I'm bringing on some sharp pain here. Okay? So, what are some of the things that you're seeing here that are very characteristic of shoulder pain with muscle power deficits? Okay? Hang on one second. I'm going to try to... Let me bring, bring you guys up here. Okay. So... Patients complaining of, one, an arc of pain. I imagine many of you are saying, okay, I see an arc of pain and there's no significant motion loss, right? If this was truly a frozen shoulder problem, I would be seeing significant loss of external rotation, likely, and probably a severe amount of pain, even with my arm at my side at rest. But instead, typically from the studies that study shoulder impingement, what are the key things that you would usually do to test? So what are some of the key things that you would usually do to test? What are the key inclusion criteria for the studies that go to study shoulder impingement? Because then you can get a picture of what this pattern should look like when you do your exam. Okay? Good. So. Remember that for most studies related to shoulder impingement, they usually say a non-traumatic, a non-traumatic injury source. Okay, so that kind of helps to rule out labrum instability. So the non-traumatic instability, uh, non-traumatic source of pain. One or more of a couple of special tests. What do you think those special tests would be? So for those of you who are following along, what are your thoughts on the special test that? might be related to this problem that you would do, right? Hawking, Hawkins Kennedy, Nears impingement test. Some of you might do the supine impingement test. I think too many t impingement tests aren't necessary, right? Because the patient's already complaining of one, an arc of pain. That's one of the key findings. And then two, one or more of the following impingement tests like Nears, Hawkins Kennedy, Job's test. So you don't have to overdo the testing. In your mind, you already recognize that the clinical pattern, the key findings for shoulder impingement problems is absence of trauma and an arc of pain, which means I have full range, but usually somewhere around 90 degrees, I'm having a pinch, right? And so from there, I add a couple of special tests, either Hawkins-Kennedy or Nears impingement test, reproduce the patient's pain, good enough. Your job is done in terms of trying to prove that it's impingement. You don't need to do so many tests because as a movement specialist, in your mind, you need to think about what are the kinds of things that, um, what are the kinds of things that are causing this problem? Okay, so I want you to think about, just for a second, what are the kinds of things that are causing this shoulder impingement problem? I want you just type a few things up here, whatever you guys can think of as key impairments. Okay, what are some key impairments that you can examine and you can treat that might be causing shoulder impingement problems? Okay, and I'm going to try to pick up some of your comments here. Okay, I am following along. Okay, perfect. So, some of you, yes, Adarsha said hooked shaped acromion. Jade Jones has said shoulder impingement uh, bursitis, exactly. Ralph, what's up, Ralph, saying impingement. Yep, there's no capsular restriction right on, you guys. Yes, Nears and Hawkins Kennedy. So, Christopher, talking about short and stiff levator scap and pec minor. Beautiful. So let me ask you this, Chris, Christopher, 
when you have a short and stiff levator scap or a pectoralis minor tightness, what does that show up as in your postural e eval? And this is open to anyone who's listening in. When you have a tight or short, short or stiff levator scap, what position does that put the scapula in that you would look for? Because this is a key finding. This is a movement fault that you're going to be watching out for that you can correct. So what do you got? Let's see. Hi, Kat. Welcome, Kat, for joining us. Thanks for joining us. What do you guys think? What are some... You guys are right on track, right? So someone has mentioned we have some short and stiff scapulothoracic muscles. Can that influence the scapula and its position? All right. In our conversation, with, uh, as we're, we're working on trying to refine the app and trying to figure out what's the cleanest way to help people decide what are the key impairments to look for, the, the evidence seems to suggest that you should look for, as, as, as Christopher has mentioned, some scapular faults, and we would distill them down to three scapular faults. Can you guys think of or type in what are the three main scapular faults that you would want to watch for in your shoulder patient? It doesn't even have to be impingement. What are three common scapular faults that I think are key for any good physical therapist to be looking for in your, um, in your examination of a shoulder patient? Three scapular faults. So let's see what you guys got. Ralph has got downward rotated scap right on. Uncle Poe has just joined in. Good to see you, Poe Mai. Christopher, downwardly rotated scap, right? So think about this. Why do people impinge in the subacromial space, right? Why are these tissues here being impinged in the subacromial space? Well, doesn't the scapula have a lot to say about that? Doesn't a depressed or downwardly rotated scapula or a scapula that will not upwardly rotate enough create a problem for the, for the subacromial tissues, whether it's a bursitis or a, or a tendonitis or a tendinosis, okay? So you guys are right on. Okay, so someone said winging, tilting, downward rotation, adarsha, right on, okay? Three main scapular faults that we think the evidence supports, and there are three special tests to help you prove that these faults exist, okay? So three special tests. If you see in your static posture observation... If you see winging, if I see winging, then what kind of test, what kind of muscles do you think are weak that I should probably do muscle tests on? So I'm talking about winging right now, so I'm just watching. Welcome, Charlie. So let's talk about winging. You have a shoulder impingement patient and you see winging. You want to know, does that winging really contribute to the patient's shoulder impingement? So I'm going to ask him, hey... If you raise your arm, ouch, that's my pinch, I'm going to correct the wing with a scapular retraction test, and I'm going to see if your elevation becomes pain-free. Because that tells me, ah, winging, this is one of the problems, one of the impairments I need to treat. So what muscles related to winging? Serratus anterior, yep, C-H-E-Y-N-E, -E. Cheney, I think. Good answer, serratus, jade, serratus, zahid, good job. Serratus anterior, right? So I'm trying to co connect your postural observation, medial border winging, to some muscular involvement. Either it's a motor control problem, it's a strength problem. And I'm going to correct that and double check, does that improve the shoulder impingement problem? Is that fair? Okay, let's move on to the next one. Someone, I think, uh, someone had talked about pec minor, right? So if I think pec minor, what would I see on the patient that would make me think, ooh, pec minor might be tight? Okay, so I'm looking for answers, guys. You guys are doing good. In fact, where's my bell? There is a lot of bell ringing tonight. All right, good job. Let's see. So if, if the scapula is being affected... I see Chris talking about anterior tilt, right? So, pec minor tightness, if the patient is standing in front of me and I see inferior angle winging, right? Inferior angle prominence, put it that way. I'm assuming that the patient has an anterior tip scapula. 
And so in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I should look at pec minor length. And I should do a, I should kind of do a posterior tilt of the scapula, right? I'm going to reposition the scapula here and ask him to elevate his arm and see if his impingement pain gets better. Now, he can't feel pain because the central nervous system kind of ends at a dead end. But in this person's case, the point I'm trying to make is when I do my repositioning of the scapula, I tack down, I give that scapula posterior tilt, does his impingement pain get, get better? Because I want to know. I want to know, should I spend time working on pec minor and improving his scapular posterior tilt? That's part of my motor control training. Okay? All right, awesome. Last scapular fault. We've talked about two scapular faults. One is winging or excessive medial rotation. So the patient cannot or is unable to maintain the scapula stable on the thorax. And two, we've talked about the insufficient posterior tilt of the scapula, right? The last one is what? Depressed and downwardly rotated scapulas. So the patient, when you look at them and observe their scapular inferior angles, you might see that one inferior angle is lower than the other. So I'm going, wow, that looks like a depressed scapula. No wonder there's not enough space for the subacromial tissues when he elevates his arm. Or I may see that his medial border, his medial border is downwardly rotated. So I'm thinking to myself, hey, if he starts downwardly rotated, how will he get his full 60 degrees of scapular upward rotation? So I'm going to watch him. Please elevate your arm, sir. He elevates his arm, and I'm watching. Does his scapula go from here to here, 60 degrees of upward elevation? And if that scapula can do that, or does he need my help? The scapular assistance test is, okay, I'm going to help you upwardly rotate while you do your asterisk sign. And sure enough, the patient says, man, my, my sharp pain, my subacromial pain is gone. So now, in your mind, as part of the clinical pattern, okay, in review, we are talking about shoulder impingement. And the key findings for shoulder impingement is essentially, as most studies use these key findings, no, uh, basically, a traumatic cause of shoulder pain, right? So a traumatic cause, which kind of helps you to move away from the shoulder instabilities. And then uh, one or more positive test of the impingement tests, of which you guys named Nears, Hawkins, Kennedy, right? So these are two of the main ones. Of, of course, there's a plethora of impingement tests. I just don't think doing more tests helps you that much. Because the real question is, what are the causes of his problem? And so right now, we are talking about the causes. You can also consider that, hey, you know what? If this is really a tendon problem, if this is really a shoulder pain with muscle power deficit, then maybe I should test muscle power, right? So it's okay for you to ask them to do some external rotation. Okay, external rotation at 90, can they do it? Is there a lag? Is there a true rotator cuff tear, right? So you can ask them to do external rotation and watch. Do they have power? Or is it painful and weak or painful and strong? You're kind of making a determination. Is there a tendon problem, right? So on top of that, let me ask you, while we're in this moment, Think about impingement and rotator cuff tendonitis and rotator cuff tendinosis and calcific tendonitis and eventually rotator cuff tear as all along the same spectrum. Okay, I would classify all of those categories under shoulder pain with muscle power deficits. This is what the guideline language would be because the impairments that are likely driving that problem are the same, okay? And their functional limitation is the same. They have problems lifting their arm. They have problems generating power. There's a tendon problem. So think of those as, hey, I may have some faulty mechanics here, and I'm waiting for a good therapist, a good movement specialist to analyze which parts of the components of motion that I need to function in pain-free movement, which of those are actually which of those are actually there, green light or not green light, they're not working. And so we've talked about three scapular faults. Let me ask you, there are two humeral faults that we think that the evidence suggests. Okay, there are two humeral faults. What do you guys think are the two humeral faults 
that may be connected to shoulder impingement and, for that matter, any other number of shoulder pathologies. So I'm asking you guys right now, what are two humeral faults, okay? Things that the humerus is doing wrong that may be contributing to a lot of shoulder pathology. Let's see. Kendra says more, Kendra says superior translation. Yes, absolutely. With shoulder impingement, we think it is moving too much somewhere and it's probably moving up too much or up and forward too much, right? So what else do you guys have? So Kendra, right on. Two humeral faults. There's three scapular faults, two humeral faults. Amy, Amy, that deserves a bell. Amy says anterior glide. In a series of three articles, okay, that um, I think this was by Rebecca Lawrence, a series of three articles looking at people with shoulder pain and non-shoulder pain, they found that patients with shoulder pain typically had increased anterior glide of the humerus. Okay, so the humerus is not moving precisely. Can you buy that? Can you? Now, I, I remember someone saying, hey, what about the hooked acromion? Yes, certainly the hooked acromion does not make life any better for the impingement patient. But for the secondary impingement, the person who is moving too much, anterior glide of the humerus is a known and well-established fault that we can assess for. So what would I do in my objective exam to test is the anterior glide there? One, I would just have him standing there and observe. Is the humerus anterior glided relative to the acromion? Okay? Is it anterior glided? And if they have resting pain, what happens when I posterior glide their humerus? Does their pain get better? Right? So I'm assessing what I see and I'm testing their symptoms. And if he has no symptoms, I mean, a lot of impingement patients don't have pain when you are when your arm's by your side, right? So I have to test them in their asterisk sign. Well, then I'm gonna ask him, please raise your arm, go to your arc of pain, ouch, that's my pain. What happens when I add a posterior glide? What happens to your pain? Oh, that feels a lot better. All of a sudden in my mind, I have, I have ability to assign value to an impairment that I found. This is very important for physical therapists. We can't just say, well, shoulder impingement, I'm gonna do rotator cuff strengthening no, I'm asking you to look for three scapular faults, two humeral faults, okay? So we have one humeral fault, which was anterior glide syndrome. There's a second humeral fault. What do you guys think? Second humeral fault. Tony says, yes, internal rotation, sitting anteriorly and superiorly in the capsule. So what if my patient, I'm going to act like my patient here. What if my patient, I'm looking at his posture and his hands are always like this. And when he reaches up, when he reaches up, he does not fully externally rotate. We would consider this humeral fault as excessive medial rotation or insufficient external rotation during elevation. Is that fair? Because we know that when you fully elevate, you should externally rotate. It gives you clearance. It gives you space in the subacromial region. Okay, so three scapular faults, two humeral faults, if a patient has pain reaching up and I externally rotate him and his pain gets better, I've just helped to prove that I need to teach him how to move with external rotation and elevation. And I need to check some muscles. What muscles do you think get tight when a person elevates their arms? What medial rotators of the humerus? So I'm just drawing connections here. So I want to hear from you guys what muscles can contribute to someone who insufficiently externally rotates. Okay, What muscles are those that you can assess and you can treat? What do you guys got? Okay, What do you think, Tony? Jake? Ralph? OK, we've got subscap. Aaron says subscap and lats. Amy says pec major. Right? These are all the medial rotators that become tight when you elevate your arm. So those are the muscles that I would look for. Okay? So three scapular faults. With those scapular faults, we talked about anterior tilted or insufficient posterior tilting. Right. So someone whose inferior angle is prominent, so it's an anterior tilted scapula, I would say this person, I would look for pec minor tightness. 
I would also look for low trap weakness. We know that in a lot of upper quarter shoulder patients and tennis elbow patients, upper trap, lower trap, mid trap, a lot of these muscular dysfunctions. Okay, so we've got winging. We've talked about serratus and mid trap. I would check the strength of mid trap and strength and coordination. Strength and coordination of mid trap and serratus. And then we have this upward rotation this insufficient elevation and upward rotation. So the person starts with their scapula depressed and they do not sufficiently elevate and upward rotate in the scapula. And I proved it with my scapular assistance test. So I would look for a serratus anterior, upper trap and low trap, the force couple, right? Those are the muscles that need to function to give me space underneath my subacromial arch. And so those are the muscles that I would look for. So if you take a step back, and we have one more main fault to talk about, but if you take a step back, what, I just, what we just talked about is some faults of the humerus and the scapula. With the humerus, we talked about anterior glide, and with the humerus, we also talked about insufficient in external rotation, and we've talked about some muscles that we would want to check and do soft tissue, contract, relax, stretching, and motor coordination retraining, right? Don't let yourself hang out forward. Bring your shoulder, hold it in a good position, and we can talk about training for that. We'll talk more about training for that in our next session. Okay? I'm just going to finish with a couple more things. What do you need? Okay, we have one more main fault. Okay, there, actually, there's, there's two more main faults, and this is really simplifying it, but I think there's a lot of evidence for these, and if you do a good job of assessing these faults, you're going to help a lot of people with shoulder pain. Okay? What spinal fault, what do you need for shoulder elevation, full shoulder elevation? What do you have to have? So let's see. Yep, Aaron's right. We got to do some muscle length testing. Victoria, right on. Subscap also is very important, but I'm talking about what else do we need that a lot of people, this guy's got pretty good, pretty good posture here, but a lot of our people coming in with shoulder problems, what do you see? What do, I need, what do I need to investigate on this patient to, dis, dis, to decide, is that an, a, a big impairment that I need to manage? So what do we got? Extension, Steve, right on. Multiple bells for all of you. Nico, Aaron, Steve, right on, guys. Exactly. If I see someone, okay, whether it's neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, and his thorax is really flexed, that's telling you, that the neck is in a bad place, the shoulder is in a bad place, and the lumbar is in a bad place. So always, always I go in there and I say, hey, what happens to your asterisk sign when I improve your position? Because I'm trying to get some, some ability to sense how much time should I spend here treating that. Okay. So if I see stiffness here and he has a difficult time improving that, but when I manually help him, his shoulder pain improves, what kind of interventions would you do? I'm looking for you. What kind of interventions have you learned that you've seen in clinic that you think will be an effective way to improve insufficient thoracic extension? So what do you guys got? I am loving your comments, guys. Kendra, right on. Thoracic spine extension, nice job, Uncle Poe. Timothy, Raul, right on. Hey, so, yes, tight, tight pecs. Okay, there is good evidence, right on, guys. Thoracic manipulations, foam rollers, Steve says foam rollers, central PAs. When you th see joints that are stiff and you are noticing that they are unable to come into a better position, then I consider that a thoracic spine with mobility deficits. So I'm going to use the manual therapy techniques like PAs, manipulations, right? We can do our manipulations, and then we can. One other thing that I think is really important, when you are done improving that mobility and getting them onto the foam roll, there is pretty cool evidence to suggest that some taping. Tape them along the spinous process, put them in a good posture, tape them and say, I want you to wear this tape for the next couple of days. Make sure you don't have any tape allergies. 
it will remind you to stay in a good position because this will allow everything else. I, I use this for neck pain, I use this for back pain, I use this for shoulder pain. Tape them right down the spinous process with some firm tape. Okay, You can use a cover roll and luco tape and you want them to feel when they start to slouch. Then they can get some awareness. You're re-educating them. You're re-educating them. Okay, I want basically to change this and I can't change this if all my manual therapy work goes to waste when they go home and watch TV slouch on the couch for the next five hours. Right? So I'm going to, I need to change them. I need them to buy into that. And I need to encourage them. And usually what we'll do is we'll do taping for a couple of days down the middle. And then we'll give that area a rest. And we'll do taping like a V. But they're still in a good po posture. Taping like a V here. That will also remind them not to slouch, but it will prevent you from having tape on the same area for too long, so it reduces skin breakdown. I think this is very important when you're trying to manage thoracic kyphosis, is you can't just hope that your manipulation and your PAs is going to do the job, right? You have to give them some way to learn how often and why excessive kyphosis, insufficient extension, is part of their shoulder problem, okay? So keep that in mind in terms of the taping. So, we've talked about three scapular faults, two humeral faults, one thoracic fault. Now, can people have problems if they're too extended as well? Absolutely. We see a lot of pictures, a lot of, a lot of upper, extremity, uh, upper uh, extremity athletes who have very stiff and extended thoracic spines. They need mobility too. Okay? So, but your, your treatments are very similar. I would say this, prior to this session, as I was doing a quick review of the literature, you'll, be, you'll find it very interesting that in many of the studies, actually adding the manual therapy. Now, of course, studies show one thing and studies show the other. I was surprised to see that addition of manual therapy in several of the recent studies did not show a significant improvement. Okay, it did not necessarily help scapular kinematics. It did not really help thoracic kinematics. But we know that these thoracic manipulations can modulate pain, and that can help people exercise. So that's not a bad thing. And there, there is good evidence, actually. There's pretty good evidence that's, that shows doing something to the thoracic spine can help with shoulder problems. So don't get me wrong about that. I, I'm just sharing with you that some of the latest articles in GSPT actually demonstrated actually a surprising lack of change with, with manual therapy okay, to the spine. But nevertheless, Last couple of things, okay? We, we haven't talked much about muscle. We have talked somewhat about muscle, and I think we can all agree that muscular impairments of the scapula, of the rotator cuff, are all key impairments. What capsular restrictions, okay? Again, we're going to have to assess them all, right? But what capsular restrictions do you think is a key impairment that the research seems to indicate might drive anterior glide syndrome might drive superior migration of the humeral head. So what do you guys got? And I see your question, Susan, so we'll take a second to talk about that. Okay, good. That, that is a very good question. I will bring it up in one second. So you guys are doing postural re-ed. Kendra's got some manips going. That's good stuff. Foam rollers. So I'm asking right now, Yep, everybody's coming in right. So, Cheney, so let me just say, most of you are saying tight posterior capsule, right? Think about this. In a lot of shoulder patients, the evidence seems to suggest that the humerus likes to anterior translate during elevation. If the humerus likes to anterior translate, it is more likely that the anterior capsule is lax and the posterior capsule or posterior cuff is short and tight. Okay, so in your assessment, I'm going to expect you to assess all of them. Anterior glide, posterior glide, inferior glide, because only when you assess uninvolved and then involved and make a logical and your best assessment of hypomobile or not, hypermobile or not, then you can go in and say, okay, when I corrected the anterior glide, they felt better, and I also felt a stiffness or decreased posterior glide, so I'm going to treat that and reassess my asterisk sign. That is the pattern of how you should do things, right? 
assess uninvolved, assess involved, and then try to see if your glide is going to make a difference in their functional movement. That's what, what the asterisk sign is for. So right on. That's good. So we have now covered a lot of the key faults. When you come and look at shoulder patients, okay, I'm not even talking about just impingement. Could this person have frozen shoulder and have all these faults? Yes. Could the patient have labral tears, slap lesions, instability, and have some of these faults? Yes. This is where the movement specialist is not tied to just the pathology. The movement specialist is tied to what are the impairments of the body systems that are causing you pathology, and I'm going to fix that. I'm going to systematically search it out and fix it. Okay. So we kind of went through a postural exam, a movement exam, assessing these movement faults and seeing if I corrected those movement faults, would the patient's symptoms improve? And that helped me to target my treatment and my examination so that I could spend time on the most relevant impairments. You'll see a slide on one of, uh, on my CSM presentation that says, it shows a guy who's dumping water out of a sinking boat. So he's trying to fix whatever impairment he thinks he can fix, except he's got this big leak in the back of the boat sprouting water, right? He's sinking because of he's not spending time on the right impairments. He just keeps doing all the other stuff, hoping, hoping for the best, okay? So, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of great, great thoughts, okay? Now, one good question. Let's see. Susan has a question. When retraining the scapular muscles... What cues do you use to get the serratus and lower trap facilitated and engaged without upper trap compensation? So this is a really difficult question. One thing that I have not talked about, and maybe we'll set up another day to talk about it. When I was at a World Congress in Singapore a couple of years ago, I listened to um, a, a colleague out of, uh, and I'll post the links, I'll post the articles, um, Sebastian Roy out of Canada and some fantastic work that they're doing with motor control training. So they actually, as part of their rehab, are working on scapular positioning, and scapular positioning without humeral movement yet. We're just going to work on positioning the scapula, help the patient fire the muscles, okay? Engage these muscles. Don't let the scapula be too abducted. In here, I would engage your serratus muscles, okay? Bring that scapula down. Now hold that position, practice that position. This is part of motor control training, getting a nice, controlled, stable base before you start going into elevation, right? Because once you start adding elevation, all of these motor patterns kick in. So we do easy stuff. I'm gonna help you find a good scapular position. I'm gonna manually take you there, ask you to hold it, cue some of these muscles, go ahead, turn these muscles on, hold this position. And as the patient practices and gets better at it, remember motor control training takes lots of repetition, then I'm going to start adding, adding humeral movement in scaption with, with the fact that they are able to hold this good scapular position. So hold the position in scaption, work in scaption to 90. Now, a few weeks later, the patient's doing better, good scapular control, good strengthening, now we'll go into higher levels of elevation and more into abduction, right? So you begin to transition out of these scapular positioning exercises. And then you begin to move more into more functional movements. And the guidelines talks about that. As the patients get stronger, as you get the range of motion, pain-free motion back, please teach them how to move so they don't get re-injured. In regards to how to engage, right, because I need lower trap. I do need a little bit of upper trap and I need serratus to fire together to get upward rotation. So what I saw in my patient was a downwardly rotated depressed scapula. So I'm going to cue him. Go ahead, turn on your serratus muscles. Go ahead, push into me, push, push, push. I'm watching the scapula. Does he engage his serratus? And I'm also tapping. Go ahead and let's bring your shoulder blade up. I will manually help him. We'll do it together engage the muscles, and then he will practice with, by himself. Typically, we'll use wall slides, right? So you push your arms into the wall. So my arms are against the wall, and I'm gently 
trying to get upward rotation of the scapula. Now, will there be some upper trap activity? It's, it's, part, of the, it's part of the mechanism. Okay? So, but I will be cueing lower trap, cueing serratus while they're doing their wall slides, and I will spend time doing that. That's part of setting up the stable base for peripheral mobility. Okay, so it's no problem for you to spend time activating these muscles and working on that functional movement. So I hope that's useful to you, Susan. Um, and how, and Uncle Poe says, how often is there clavicle involvement that causes shoulder limitations? It's interesting. Again, I'll post the, the references to this article. You guys go take a look at it. In the Lawrence article, this is including Dr. Paul Ludwig, a lot of the really, of the best of the best of the shoulder, the, the shoulder, I think they were proud to be called the shoulder nerds. They actually found that in the patients with shoulder impingement or shoulder pain, there was insufficient posterior rotation of the clavicle, right? So could the clavicle, could that be part of insufficient upward rotation and posterior tipping? Probably. Okay, because it's a shoulder girdle, right? Everything's connected. So I think, yes, it's not the first place that I would look, okay, treating AC and treating SC. We haven't really talked about that much. But when they looked at the kinematics of the shoulder girdle, they did find a difference, a significant difference in posterior rotation, insufficient posterior rotation. So maybe you can mobilize or help assist that. Not so easy to do, easier, easier said than done. But it's a good question. I don't think you can isolate any one piece of the shoulder girdle and the, the glenohumeral joint away from one another. They all work together for this functional movement. So I think it's a good, it's a good thought. Um, and it's worth checking out after you've taken care of the big things. Don't go after it with it in the beginning. Okay? You guys also, Aaron's got, hey, I want to do scapular P and F. Scap setting, good. And Susan, yep. Nelson, flying squirrel, why do we keep blaming upper trap? Yeah, yeah, you know, I spent many years of my career trying to stretch and soft tissue the upper trap. We'll save that for another day. But remember that the upper trap is an important part of the mechanism for elevation and upward rotation of the scap, right? But the upper trap can be upset, it can be uncomfortable, just remember that an uncomfortable and painful upper trap is not always a short and tight upper trap. We'll talk about that more in another session. But I am so glad so many of you came out to join me tonight. I'm excited that there are so, this, this group of people are, are so excited to, even so late at night, joining us on the West East Coast, um, are all part of this awesome profession, right? The movement specialist. And my hope today was that when you look at shoulder problems, and when you check out, when I post the play that pattern out, you will see that all of these impairments are nicely organized. If we, as the movement specialist, said when a shoulder patient comes into me, I have in my mind some key faults that I'm looking for, some key impairments, and I'm going to systematically test which of these impairments are affecting the patient's asterisk sign, and I'm going to target my treatment and spend time and use a good amount of dosage instead of shotgunning, doing everything, right? Strengthen this, strengthen that, soft tissue this, uh, mob this and mob that. Why not spend time on the things that make the most difference to the patient's asterisk sign? I hope that is useful for you, you guys. Uh, share, share the video if you like this video. And, you know, uh, this morning, actually yesterday morning, we finally have our test version of the GATE app. Learning about GATE and human movement is never going to be the same again. I, I will, we'll, we'll put out a few teaser shots. It's not quite ready yet. We're fine-tuning it, but it will be ready by CSM. It is the beginning of a series of apps that we'll, we're going to be making that will help you decipher human movement. What is normal and good human movement? What are non-optimal ways to move? And how we can educate people and strengthen people uh, we're so excited about this new app. You can, I can hardly hold it in, and I'd be excited to show you guys. So spread the word, share the video as much as you can, and looking forward to seeing you guys. Hey, swing by the booth at CSM. I, am, I would love to have a picture with the guys who are hanging out with me on Facebook Live. Um, come, come, come hang out. Come see what we're up to. Come check out all the new apps that we're putting out, 
And we love your support, and we love being part of your learning, and are excited to, um, to be able to spend this time with you. So thanks, guys, for hanging out, and looking forward to seeing you guys at CSM, and then we'll probably pick up again the following week. But have a good evening.